Shall we talk about the two elephants that are in the room? Two elephants? I, I can think of one <laughs> very big elephant in the room. Hello, I'm Liz. And I'm Jamie. Welcome to Follow the Boat, in which we discuss what it's really like to give it all up to live on a boat. And go travelling around the world. We've been doing it since 2006, and we're still at it. Each week we talk about our latest YouTube video. And about boats, sailing, travel, or anything else which floats into our heads. And if you leave a comment we like, we'll give you an answer and a name check. Peace, Peace and, and fair, fair winds. winds. Well, there's a pink elephant, obviously we do need to talk about, but the other elephant is the fact that we're here. Yes, that's what I was going to say that was precisely how I was thinking of starting this podcast. Oh, were you? You were going to start the podcast, were you? Sorry. My podcast. Yes. <laughs> With your lead and guidance, since this is your podcast. <laughs> Last week we said, next week this podcast is going to be filmed from an anchorage. And you actually promised, you, your words were, we promise. And you've yes. broken your promise, Elizabeth. Shall we explain why? Yeah, go on then. So we were supposed to be at anchor and we really wanted to be at anchor and we're not. We're still in the bloody marina. Here we are. And do you know why? It's because we haven't got our passports. Yes. And they are supposed to be coming today, but who knows? They've had our passports now for two weeks. Yeah. As people who are familiar with our channel know, in order to benefit from an extended stay in Malaysia, we have to keep renewing our visa. Yep. And so the last application was to get a final one month extension, which will buy us enough time to prepare the boat and get ready to go up the coast to leave. However, one of the applications for visa extension faked some documents. Now I should say at this point- None of us. That's none of us. Nope. None of us at all. Nope. But someone faked some documents. Right. And this caused a hiccup uh, the admin at immigration decided, right, so they uh, basically they've been going through our applications with a fine tooth comb. Right. They've now had our passport for two weeks. Yes, I didn't know that detail. That's interesting. So that's why it's taking so long. Yeah. So the idea is that when we get them back, we're extended to the end of February, which gives us more than enough time to leave Sabah, which is what we want to do. But we have to make quite a big journey to get out and to get on and to get out of Malaysia. So we need to be going soon. And it should have been Friday, then it was yesterday, and then it was today, and now we're hoping it's going to be tomorrow. Yeah, well, the latest update we received was that not that they're going to pick up the passports, but they're right. going back to immigration just to see if they will be ready. So we right. don't even have a guarantee we're getting them today. Right, okay, so that's Alvin, our shipping agent our and friend. Agent and friend, yeah, he's doing this for us. Okay, so uh, the best thing is to just leave it with Alvin. Uh, if we turn up mob handed, there's three boats want to go at the same time, it's probably going to be more intimidating, probably do us more harm. Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, my idea is, is that one of us should go up there and argue the case and explain to these people yeah. that uh, it pr exactly, <laughs> exactly say, so, yeah, we're trying to leave, but as yeah. you say, there's only a, a, a window that we can get out and because we have to check out before the end of February. Yeah. And of course, we've allowed ourselves a few days contingency because invariably something will go wrong on the way down. We might have to pull over for the night. Uh, we allowed ourselves two days in a particular port to maybe refuel. Yeah. And of course, the people at immigration are not going to understand this. So, so I, I was thinking radically last night, I mean, someone did bring it up around the table of bollocks that perhaps what we do is we just check out from here. We just check out here and we spend the next couple of weeks you know, going along the coast and checking out of, well, basically we won't be in Malaysia and they don't need to know. I don't know, I mean, how do you feel about that? We just check out now, before. Well, it, it's not that they don't need to know. We could do that quite feasibly and we can still travel down the coast because yeah. we're, we're yachts in passage. Yeah. You know, that's a, there's nothing illegal about that. Yeah. The problem is, is that if you need to pull into port for an emergency, yeah. that's gonna create a you know, it's, a massive it, it's going to be messy. Okay. All right. Well, we'll we'll see what happens, and I'm going to guarantee <laughs> next oh, week. I'm not saying it anymore. I'm going to say it because I live in hope. So that's the first elephant. Let's get on to the second elephant and get it out of the way <laughs> because this won't mean so much for people listening to the audio podcast. But if you're watching this on YouTube, there is something very, very obvious in this cockpit. Well, if you listen to last week's podcast. You will have heard me say that I was going to dye my hair pink. And there's pink and pink. And then there's neon cerise pink. <laughs> <laughs> 
and uh, that's the colour I went for yesterday. Well, I have to say, it looks <laughs> fabulous, darling. <laughs> when I announced it last week, I had some comments. I'm going to read a few of them out. They're quite funny. Um, Captain Mortified, pink hair would look great on you and would be fun. And that's exactly what I thought. Uh, Paul Wyand, pink hair sounds good. Cool. And Deborah Taylor, oh Liz, I'm so pleased you're not going with the blue rinse. <laughs> but you've chosen to be one of the pink ladies. All you'll need is a leather jacket and Jamie can be John Travolta. Oh, I often dream of being John Travolta. I've got the moves. Yeah, you have definitely got the moves. Um, I only had one dissension and that came from LKM. No pink, please. You'll look like a dyed Easter chick. To which I replied, that's the look you're going yes, for. Yes, and I think I've achieved it. I think you have. So, yes, it's, it's bright pink. It was just a bit of fun. Never, never played with these mad colours before. It's short now, so I can dye it any colour. And within a few weeks, it grows out. So uh, Or fall out. Or falls out. It's still there today. We'll see how it goes. No, it looks good. And it, it accentuates your blue eyes. Does it? Yes, it really does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's cool. So there you go. So there... Those two elephants are out in the open. They've been dealt with. We're stuck in the cockpit still in the marina and my hair is now bright pink. Marvellous. So if you are listening and you want to see my hair, you can watch this on YouTube. You can go and have a quick look at the video version of this on YouTube. Yes, recommend you wear sunglasses when you watch <laughs> uh, it. Yeah, because you have put lights all around the cockpit shining at us so that we stand out and we can be seen. Yes. And. Uh, I'm dying a death of heat exhaustion. It is hot. It is hot under here. So hopefully when we do the next podcast at anchor, which we're not promising, it will be a little bit cooler. Now, th there will be a little bit of background noise again. We keep talking about background noise, but this one's quite relevant because we've got Roy of Chaska, who's mm. next door to us. Mm. And he is convinced that his termites have returned. Yeah. So he's dealing with this situation once and for all by yeah. fumigating the boat. Yeah. And this means that he has to empty the entire contents everything, of his boat. Everything's everything. got to come off. I, I quizzed him about that and, it, and everything's got to come off because the, the chemicals they're using are highly dangerous. Mm. I thought it was cyanide. Apparently it's not. Not it's cyanide. He did tell me. I as don't dangerous. remember. As yeah. dangerous. Yeah. So he started at about seven this morning unloading. Can you imagine trying to unload this place? God. It's a hell of a job, so he's going to be doing that all day. He will be. So he'll be going backwards and forwards, trundling away. Yeah. But uh, the marina's very kindly given him a little storage shed. To yeah, that's kind gear. of them, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that, that is good. I have wondered, since we're next to Roy, whether we need to worry about termites. Has that crossed your mind? It has crossed my mind because we've yeah. got a lot of wood on board. Yeah. But, you know, uh, there's not much we can do about it right now. I mean, no. this is the thing, you know, we're all getting ready to leave. And, uh, you know, this happens to Roy at the last minute. It's not ideal, is it? It, to be fair, it's not the last minute because he's had them and he had them treated. Yes, he thought he'd dealt with them. Yeah, so it's so they've been on his boat for a while. Mm. Um, yeah, and we thought it had gone and that and they were dealt with months ago, weren't mm. they? But I, yeah, it does cross your mind. Oh God, I hope one hasn't come onto our boat. And how do you tell? Do you know? How do you know? Well, they're. We established they are they're white ants, aren't they? Termites. Well, that's what somebody said. Yeah. So termites are white. They fly. Someone else said their wings drop off when they die. You don't really see them because they live inside things yeah. and underground and you don't really see them uh, until they're, what's not spawning, what's the proper word, till they they leave the nest. They all go out for a day, <laughs> for a jolly <laughs> a little day and trip. die. Um, I don't know. I think you have to get a queen for it to be a problem, don't you? Uh, Roy said that he could hear them. Right. Okay. That's what he said. He could hear them. Yeah, and he's got them at the very front of his boat where he's got a lot of wood. Yeah, and he remember he had his bowsprit uh, yeah. remade, so that's new. And that's how he found them. Yes, it's not in the bowsprit, by the way. Not not in the new bowsprit. He yeah. thinks he picked them up in the boatyard, which we were also at. Yes, we were. The one good thing for us, though, is that there's nothing on board wooden that's um, structural. So if anything, if it would if it were to come on board, it's going to be more cosmetic stuff, isn't it? I mean, it'll be a pain in the bloody ass, but it wouldn't actually sink the boat. No, no. But the problem is that it, they would probably start eating from behind the veneer, so you wouldn't know about it for quite some time. Yeah, the floors, everything. Oh, anyway, let's just touch wood. Ha ha ha! Touching wood. <laughs> Apart from 
your pink hair. What, what yes. else have you been up to this week? Yes, well, day? I was going to ask you that. Um, so for me, it's kind of, you know, there's a, it's a bit of a theme here. It's bloody visas still. Uh, so I've got good news and bad news. Mm -hmm. We've done the bad news, in fact. But I have got good news. Okay. And the good news is that yesterday I was informed by Indonesia that we have our visas. So oh, wow. we are legally allowed to enter Indonesia on the boat and we have three months clear uh, to do what we like in Indonesia. At the end of the three months, we then can renew for a month at a time, up to three times. So it, potentially we have six months in Indonesia. Mm. So that was good news. Excellent. Yes, yeah, so I was happy about that. Um, the other thing I've been doing is, it always seems to be paperwork that I end up having to do. <laughs> but I did something this week that I really wanted to do for ages, and I uh, put all my recipes together, which I've got in all kinds of nooks and crevices, on my phone and on my laptop. I put them all into a PDF, so I'm going to print it out and I'm going to have my recipe book. And of course there are recipe books all over the place, but these are recipes that I use regularly. And with a brain like a sieve, I just like to just go back and check them. So we're going to pick those up today. We're also, we've got the uh, cruising guide to Indonesia. We've got it, but we've only got the electronic version. We weren't able to pick up our proper book at the time of getting it because we didn't have time and they weren't able to get it to us. So we've never actually got the book that we were allowed to have. So what I've done is I've taken out the chapters where I hope we're going to be in Indonesia and I'm going to get those printed off. So that will be, they'll be easier to use. Yes, and we should say, by the way, we are allowed to do this because, as yes. you say, we're we are entitled to a hard copy. Yes. So we are doing this legally. Yes. Uh, it is a bugbear of mine, and I think I've probably been guilty of it in the past, but I do think, you know, there's a lot of cheapskate yachties out there who, who pass around photocopies of photocopies of yeah. cruising guides. Yeah. And I think it's worth spending the money on buying the original version. And all the work that's gone into exactly, it. Exactly, yeah. Do you agree? Or maybe you disagree. Leave a comment for us on Twitter at Follow the Boat. And then the other thing I've been doing and I've really enjoyed doing is playing with my vacuum sealer <laughs> and going shopping and playing with the new freezer. Yes, because we've been provisioning. Yeah, that was a big part of the last week, yeah. And it's the most provisioning we've done in a very long time. Yes, because we could be away from civilization or at least places where there are people so we won't be able to buy things mm. so we started the provisioning with your your basics your pulses and rice and things like that that um, you just pile up in into the cupboards and, and keep and they'll keep for ages and they're easy and then as you get closer and closer to leaving you, f you end up with the freshest things as you leave so I did some fresh stuff yesterday but in the previous week, I was buying things to freeze and things that I could vacuum seal that makes... It's all about basically trying to keep things for as long as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we've got a freezer full of fresh food. We have. I hope it works. Yes. <laughs> well, one thing I did this week was to build a little jacket for the yes. freezer. So I ordered some... It's only three mil thick foam, but it's got reflective sides to it. And I'd read that any freezer or fridge system the problem isn't trying to keep the coolness in it's actually trying to keep the heat out because of course our freezer sits in our saloon which is fairly light and occasionally you might even get sunlight on it yeah so the hatch it could come straight through mm. at the wrong angle and have you yeah good. so and of course any any of that heat that sunlight even just the ambient temperature is trying to heat up that box while the compressor is trying to cool down the inside so yeah I've made a little jacket for it it looks quite neat doesn't it looks all right looks quite yeah I quite like it I don't mind it it's certainly a, it's now a feature of the saloon <laughs> you can't miss it now do you really think it's going to work well I haven't done any scientific testing of it but what I have noticed is that the amber light has come on more frequently and that means that the compressor is turned off right so when the green light is on the compressor is running Okay. And previously, it was just running all the time because it's trying to maintain that minus 18 degrees yeah. that we've set it at. And we had set it at minus 22, but we've set it on minus 18. Right. I've noticed now that the compressor is turning off more frequently. So okay. I think that's a, a, certainly an improvement. Isn't there this thing with um, any kind of electrical thing that when you turn it on, you have a big jump? So a if surge. it's turning a surge, so if it's turning on, frequently that's using more 
Do you know, I need to look this up because a lot of a lot of electronic uh, in, uh, instruments items now have a soft start. Right. So it's tempered. And I don't know how this works because, of course, the unit is on anyway. Mm. So I don't know. I need to look at that. OK, so what we were doing before that was we were using a timer. Yeah, and you, I, are you going to carry on doing I that? I think we'll go back to that because I think during the night time we can get away with it being off, you know, for an hour or so and then turn on for an hour or okay. may, maybe even off for two hours and on for one hour. And the other thing, of course, is that at, at anchor it's always cooler. Yes, yeah, definitely, for sure. It's yeah. it's so so hot in this marina at the moment, yeah. so I think we'll see a change. This was all going to be fine if we'd had working lithium batteries, but as I alluded to last week, we had a problem. Are well, you going to tell them all now? Well, no, but during this week, we had a <laughs> glimmer of hope that yeah. perhaps it wasn't a... F I'm not going to give the game away, uh, but unfortunately that died a death within 24 hours. So we're kind of stuck right. with our current setup. So you are giving the game away in that you're telling everybody that we've got a problem with our new lithium batteries, mm. but we have still got the old bank, which has done us proud for plenty of, yeah. I don't know, a couple of years. Yeah. And it's still fine. Yeah. It's just that having the addition of the freezer we would have helped, it would have really have helped to have extras, wouldn't it? If we were normal cruisers, the setup we have now, even running the freezer, wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. The issue we have is that we spend a fair bit of time on, on heavy duty computers. Yes. Yeah. And these draw a lot of power, especially yeah. when you're editing videos. You've just so. got to get quicker. <laughs> <laughs> it's your, because you have a, a full. Oh, proper. sorry, who, whose podcast is this? It's, well, I just do mine on my little laptop. Yes, but, but you do but yours on your desktop. Yeah, but your, even your laptop is, yeah. it's, a, it's a fast, powerful laptop that yeah. you're using. So even that, as laptops go, is yeah. pretty hefty on but your not batteries. as hungry as yours? No. No, OK. All right, so there we are. So that's the freezer. Mm. Um, we're kind of, yeah, so it's not ideal, but I don't think we've ever set off anywhere, ever, knowing everything's perfect? Of course not. And do you think it will be right to do that? Set off somewhere knowing everything, you've done everything you can, everything's perfect? Of course you do that. Yes. That's precisely what you do. But don't you also think that if you think that, you're, trying to you're lead, tempting fate. You're this is what I'm me saying. To, no, there's no such Pride thing. before a fall? No, you, you do everything that you yes. can that's practically possible. Yeah. There are lots of little jobs, but they're not none of them technical. They're just like stowing jobs and cleaning bits, like things like that, that I'll do on passage. Yeah. So I got rid of a whole load of clothes this week. I'm glad to hear it. I got rid of two enormous bags stuffed to the brim of old T-shirts and things that I love and I've kept for 10 years and I never wear. Mm. I mean, things that I got from London when I came on board. So that's 20 years old. It shows you how good quality they were. But I just never wear them, and I just can't justify having them on board. Can you believe, after all this time, I'm still going through that? Yes, I can. You can? Yes. What about you and your shirts and your stuff and your hats and things like that? Well, I had a big clear out. Yeah. And in fact, there was, I did vlog about this, but I decided not to keep in because it was just so boring. <laughs> but maybe it isn't. I talked about my switch from cotton-based shirts to the quick drying yeah. clothing, yeah. which I thought could be an interesting subject, but the way I recorded it was very it was boring. Really boring. It was very dry. It? Well, you didn't have me in there, so that's no, why it's so not. boring. Um, it's true, because I love cotton and never thought I would wear anything else, but I have got, like you, yeah, technical clothing mm. uh, particularly. So really true in the tropics, because we, we're just hot all the time. Yeah. But if, you, if you're not in the tropics, perhaps not so important although obviously on a boat you get wet and you want to dry quickly so yes. yeah and I think the point about throwing away your loved pieces it's really relevant I know particularly women it's it's a subject that comes up a lot on the forums woman to woman oh you know I wanted to take these I want to take what can I leave what should I take and I always say be brutal get rid of everything I got rid of everything before I got on board but I didn't did I even now I've still got some of my silk pieces yeah. haven't anymore they've gone Glad to hear it. <laughs> so um, I think that's. Uh, did I have anything else to say about myself? Uh, you've always got go something to say about yourself. <laughs> yeah, the vacuum ceiling. It is. It is. Uh, I think it's going to be a winner because not only will it keep things fresh, it reduces the size of packages right down. So where I had one pack of um, coffee grinds, I've now got 
uh, where, where, sorry, where I had two, I've now got one that takes up the same amount of space. And of course you could use it for clothing as well. Yeah, you can be so clothing. underwear, yep. uh, you know, maybe socks that you don't wear that frequently. You could chuck a few pairs of socks in one of those bags and vacuum seal, seal that. Yeah, I mean in the Med we had winter wardrobe didn't we mm. and we had summer wardrobes now those are the these were the big bags that yes. you could fit your entire oilies and fleeces in and then you put a vacuum cleaner right. on it to, to suck out the air yeah. it really worked yeah it stopped them getting moldy as well yeah. it was pretty it was pretty good yeah. we don't really need it here because it's the same weather all years all year round but yeah so that's good and uh, done the freezer so what about you what about your week what's your little pea brain wrapped itself around <laughs> well apart from doing the uh, the freezer yeah. unit and crying over the batteries. <laughs> we talked the other week about health and we're not going to talk about it today but uh, under the episode last week uh, we got a, uh, a this comment here which it, it, it shook me up a little and it was from Ron Pearson yep. because I've been talking about the shortness of breath and Ron said the shortness of breath you experienced during the hike could be related to Arteriosclerosis. Is that how you pronounce it? Arteriosclerosis. arteriosclerosis. We'll just say what he says, or other cardiac conditions. Yes. And then he said he's got some personal experience of the subject and he encouraged, encouraged me to get a cardiac stress test. Mm. And you, very sensibly, a few months ago, got a well woman checkup where you got your entire health checkup and I didn't. Can I just butt in here and say that I've been telling you? For over a year, and particularly when I took, did my checkup, do it, mm. get yourself checked out. And it took one person that you've never met leaving a comment on a video to put the heebie jeebies in you. So I'd like to say thank you very much, Ron Pearson, <laughs> but I'd also like to say to you, listen to me in, in the future, please. <laughs> so, Ron, I'm ignoring this, I'm ignoring <laughs> you entirely. Um, and, and I have to say, actually, after reading that, literally within two hours of reading his message, yeah. I was in hospital, hooked up to the ECG. I know, I couldn't believe it. You know, the first thing I knew about it was you sent me, uh, I was out shopping, you sent me a picture of yourself all hooked up, didn't you? I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> now, I've never done a full ECG before, so this is the stress test on the, on the treadmill. Uh, but in addition to that, I managed to see the consultant and he even did an ultrasound of my heart, which allows him to look at the structural integrity of your heart. So he's able to see if there's anything amiss with your heart um, and, and can actually get an indication of whether you have blockages, because that's one of the things Ron was referring to was the blockages of, the, of your arteries. Yeah. Um, there are more tests he could have done, but he was very happy with the health of my heart so so that has relieved so that's that um, we couldn't do the lung test because of right. covid of course a lot of the equipment that they would normally use for lung testing is tied up with covid at the moment okay. so so they couldn't do that but uh, they do a covid test while you were there no i didn't i did my psa though and that's something right. else which yes. people of my age and older should be yes. checking especially with my family history uh, it's important to get a PSA test done and I'm happy to say that that's all good as well. So you can relax for a bit? Yes, yeah, I can, I can leave feeling a little bit, a little bit happier now. There'll always be something, Jamie, won't there? Of, well, you normally. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was just thinking about stress tests, I could do with a couple of those. Um, yes, because uh, yesterday we had the panic that you had cancer on your face turned out to be an ingrowing hair. Well, I mean, <laughs> th look, I have to put this in context. So I noticed a dark spot uh, was developing here and to me what I should explain is on our boat we have very poor lighting yeah, where the mirrors yeah. are and you just for a reason can you yeah I mean I don't like looking at myself <laughs> in the mirror anymore you know I'm not 20 anymore I do not like looking at myself at the best of times even when I clean my teeth I walk away from the mirror <laughs> but I noticed this patch was developing here and skin cancer is something you've got to stay on top yes. of as a cruiser in the trop not even in the tropics just in if you're out in the open you should stay on top of that but uh, yes well anyway you just took one look at it and said i think it's an ingrown hair <laughs> and it was <laughs> yeah i mean it, it, i mean it, yes it was easy you just removed it yourself with a pair yeah. of tweezers which isn't difficult it's a shame i'd like to have gone in there with a pin and a good old oh, gouge uh, but i uh, yes i because i did have some cancerous precancerous forming cells didn't I over here and we discovered that they're really hot on that yeah. in this part of the world so 
Anything else to say about your heart? They did find it then. Yeah, it's very small. Sorry for interrupting, but while I've got you here, if you like what we do and you want to support us and become a Patreon, or join us on FTB Mates, or even drop a quid in the rum fund, go to followtheboat.com forward slash pub. Of course, come to the pub. Anything that you want to say about the episode that just went up, that was all about you going up the mast and looking at the AIS and the VHF problems. What have you got to say about that, young man? Well, I think a lot of our regular viewers will be relieved, perhaps uh, excited even, that we are now back to boat maintenance. Yes. We've got all the travel and all the little holidays we've taken out of the way. We're now back to pure boat maintenance. And I think that excited quite a few people who commented who we haven't heard from for some months, actually. Yes. So, yeah. Episode 288, this is, in case anyone hasn't seen it. Yes, and I was addressing some issues with the VHF and the AIS. Mm. And I actually, at the very beginning of the episode, asked people specifically, can you help me with this? Because this is a very uh, odd conundrum mm. that we had. And um, I think I got it across that it didn't make logical sense. Mm. So we got a lot of people telling me how to change an aerial and how mm. to do various tests. And, and a lot of them were really helpful and useful. But still to this day we don't have an ar a real answer as to what the what caused the problem other than perhaps a fault with the uh, radio set itself or and this is still an, uh, an option that it's actually a fault with uh, Sharon and Lindsay's VHF yes maybe it could be we'll find out over the next few weeks I think that's really ultimately that's all we can do so I've bypassed the splitter that we were using so both the AIS and the VHF have separate antennas and you'll see next week how I finished installing the AIS. Okay. Um, but yes, you're right. Really, a lot of these tests we can only do when we go out into the open waters with the other boats and do some tests from long range testing. Yeah. Uh, because uh, a couple of people suggested, well, borrow a radio off your neighbor and try to do some tests here. Well, of course, apart from the big ask of asking someone to uninstall their radio, uh, the problem is, is that there's no one out there that we can contact to do a long-range test with. There are very few English-speaking boats here who would respond on the VHF mm. to do an audio test with. Mm. So really, I think the test now can only be done when we go out and um, up the coast with the other boats that we're going with. So the moment is working. So the AIS, that's all sorts yeah, of... Yeah, we know that's fine. Yep. But the, the radio is working because it worked as we when we came in. It did, and it worked when we did our test I as know. well. Oh well, let's hope it's okay. We'll see. Yeah. We'll, we'll test it with the other boats. Yeah. yeah. Right, um, that's last week, that's 288. Was there anything particular on 288? It's all very technical, you know, it's not my sort of bag. I don't think I, um, I have anything particularly to say about 288, other than that... Well, no, uh, really. Steve Butterworth uh, very usefully said, the problem to your conundrum is obvious and I look forward to the moment you sort it out and agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Now, Ari Hill made a good suggestion and we've thought about this in the past and that's to install some foldable steps just at the top of the mast. Oh, I saw that. I'd love to do that. Mm. I'd like steps all the way up, but yes. Steps I all mean, the way up, good, good. well, they can also be an issue with your... With Catching your, lines. It, it, exactly. Plus, of course, potential corrosion leaks, blah, blah, blah. But certainly two... Just on either side so that you can stand. Correct. Yeah. It just Because it, the problem is, is trying to solder from underneath, and that's yeah. what we were showing in the video. And you need some purchase, which you don't get, do you? Correct. I mean, you when you change the light bulb in the yes. navigation lights, again, you're having to lean up. Right up, yes. And I think I could get a little higher than you. Mm. I don't, I don't. Yes, it, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, and you have to hug the mast, grip it really tightly mm. to get that purchase, just to push yourself up a bit further. In theory, there's no reason why you can't install foldable steps in situ. It's not even something you have to take the mast down to install. Right. You could in theory install them in situ so yeah we should look at that so it's mm. one of those things that needs to go on the long list of things we'd like i think the my main comment from that video is just how great it is to read all these helpful and useful comments yes and there were more coming in this morning which i'm sorry i wasn't able to make a note of yeah, uh, but more yes, people are replying all, yeah. so it's but, interesting that that people do get so invested in it uh, i think people like being presented with a conundrum or a yeah. problem and try and people love 
problem solving. Yep. So it's all, and it, it, we've learned over the years a lot, actually, haven't we, from the comments? Picked up a lot. So that's good, and particularly as the moment, at the moment, we're doing this quite close to real time. So it's not like it's three months ago and it's all finished. Now it's useful because well, it's right on time. Let's be honest. We are actually doing jobs now that we could have done over the last two years, yeah, but are rushing sure. to get done at the last minute, at the 11th hour. Yeah, there were things that never stopped us from sailing yeah. locally yes. or doing anything, really. Uh, I mean, apart from the radio, that was something we should have done. <laughs> Well, we weren't aware that there was a problem with the radio. because <laughs> we weren't using it. Yeah. Hey-ho. There we go. Um, there was a comment from Susan King on FTB Mates. Yes. Uh, we both made a note of. She asked four questions. I don't think we've got time to answer all four, but there, were, there was one we can answer quickly. When you're at anchor or on a mooring ball, and you take a land trip, how do you not worry about your boat being taken? Or do you have security alarms at doors and hatches or live cam to your phone? Or pay a local to watch the boat? Uh, what's your answer? Well, first of all, I thought it was an excellent question. As yeah. you say, as soon as I read it, I thought this, is, this could generate some, some interesting discussion here. It's been asked before, you know, but we've never really talked about it. Yeah, and Susan is a frequent contributor on our FTB Mates forum as well. She's always uh, responding, so thank you, Susan. Mm. I guess the first thing I should say is, is that we can't give too much away with regards to security on Esper. We, d we don't want to publish no. our security protocol on the boat mm. um, because that potentially could make us a target. Yeah, um, of course, the mounted guns around the side of the boat and the hid they are a giveaway, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, the hidden rays of why you know yeah, it's going to cut yeah. you up if you try and get on our boat. But to be honest, we don't really worry too much when we're at anchor. Certainly, around somewhere like here, we just leave the boat at anchor. We lock up, obviously. We keep an eye on the boat as much as we can. But it's not something that occupies our minds. What do you think? No, because I think culturally, stealing, especially from guests, let's call us guests. Mm tourists is a big cultural no-no and it's it brings disgrace and dishonor you know yeah. to the local community you've got all of that at play here so that kind of theft isn't really a, a problem now I'm not saying that it doesn't exist mm. but rare, it, though. it is it I is have rare. you heard of a boat that's been no and I have boarded? A, I have a, a little anecdote here of a couple we know who spent many years around Malaysia and then eventually went returned to Australia through Indonesia and throughout those many years they were in the area they never had a problem the very first night they got to Australia and anchored up and went ashore for a meal their boat got broken into I see. so we, we knew about thefts happening in in Turkey in in the Med we knew about mm -hmm. them but on this side of the world it's really rare Dude. the only thing that I have noticed is that they'll nick a dinghy in very poor places but then, usually, the people of the village find it and bring it back. Yes, that has happened. Uh, that said, you know, we don't, we're not completely care blasé about the subject. No. We, you know, when we do go ashore, I do think about it, and I'm always relieved when I return to the boat that A, the boat is still there, and B, when we get on board, it hasn't been broken into. It does cross your mind. Mm. But uh, around here at the moment, it's not something we have to worry about no, too much. No, there will be places, I'm, I'm sure, that that perhaps we'll visit where we'll feel a little less comfortable. My biggest worry used to be, but isn't so much anymore, was would the boat still be there? Will it have dragged? Mm. That tends to be more of a problem for me. Yeah. So, and of course the other thing is that more thefts occur, anecdotally, in marinas than they do at anchor. Yes. Tends to be other yachts, sadly, or it other does. boaters. Yeah. The second question that I want to talk about right now was clearly directed just at me, and it goes like this. <laughs> I believe you are the bravest, most courageous cruisers. Damn, she means you as well. Anyway, adventuring across the world and below the sea, anchoring alone in coves, traveling up rivers by inflatable, enduring lightning around you, hiking with a broken foot, strange rashes from walking on the beach barefoot, enduring Beaufort scale gales, traveling at night in shipping lanes, and on and on and on. Any advice on how I can get braver? Do you know what my reaction was? Because I can see you're looking a bit blank. <laughs> no, I, I, I have some thoughts on this. You have some thoughts? Yes, but uh, go on. 
What do you think? Well, my, my immediate reaction was, I didn't know I could do any of those things until I did them. Um, so the way you get braver is to go out and do things. That's what I would say. I don't know. What that was think. pretty much what I was oh, thinking. Oh, okay. There, there is a, a, a sense of ignorance when, yeah. when we approach these situations. Yeah, and it can be bliss or yeah. it can be terrifying. Yes, but you just put yourself in there and see how you cope with it. And perhaps for some people, the fear is what you are preconceiving before you put yourself in that situation. So I think that's the fear. It's not the actual activity itself. It's the fear of putting yourself in that situation. Yes. Once you're in it, I think most people just, you know, their natural instincts kick in and you cope with it. And you have to be su su you, quite often surprising to see how sometimes very brave people you meet ashore, how they come apart in situations when they're put under pressure like being on a boat in a, in a storm for example and you know perhaps vice versa the more the quieter more demure you know people ashore actually can step up to the plate and deal with the situation better so you'd be surprised how people do cope with situations yes uh, and it, it, it's 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 unpredictable it is it's a, it's a really interesting question i don't think anyone's ever asked us that before we have been through some weird stuff and don't you find when you look back at it and you think how did i get through it how did I do that? Uh, there is this thing about adrenaline kicking in and taking over. All your knowledge kicks in, certainly when it comes to the sailing in uh, difficult conditions. You know the boat, you know how to sail, you know what to do. There's no time to think about anything else. You just have to get on with it. So that's that. that uh, there's no point in thinking, oh, it could do this or I could do that. You just, you just can't. You've just got to get on with it. You've got to be practical. And I would say that that is one of the most important parts of being a cruiser is that practical way of looking at things. Funnily enough I was discussing this in a conversation yesterday about coping with these situations and f for me the biggest problem I have are the situations you have no control over. Mm. For example, and this is what we were talking about, is sailing through squalls and lightning storms. You have no control over that other than to pick your weather windows when you can and if possible avoid a squall by watching the radar but as we know squalls move in a very strange way and so we have ended up in situations in horrendous sailing conditions which we had no control over those are the times i get most frustrated but most of the time you are deciding when you go out to sea you yeah. are picking your weather windows so you're applying a bit of logic and a bit of knowledge before putting yourself into these situations yes yeah. so that's the sailing but then taking a rib up a very weird murky river uh, and through the mangroves where we know there are all kinds of snakes and creatures uh, does sound scary and is something that I didn't think I would be able to do but again it's only when I started doing it and became more familiar with it that uh, I know, I'm now fine about it. I probably wouldn't jump in the water and swim but I'm very happy to be in those situations you know with you in the in the, in a dinghy that's mm. that's something else and as for the diseases and picking up you know you've got that nasty hookworm on your foot and i hurt hurt my foot uh, these things can happen anywhere you know you could turn your ankle at home you could pick up some parasite at home you just get on with it so i think it, you might surprise yourself susan um but get yourself out there and find out how you feel about it. Gets easier. Pick up an atlas, close your eyes, point at some country, book the flight, then deal with it once you get there. Yeah. And you might surprise yourself, as you say, yeah. that yeah. actually it's not always so unfamiliar. It may yeah. seem unfamiliar when you're watching a YouTube video, but when you're, when you're there in the situation yourself, there is still a lot of familiarity around you. Mm. Um, and as we've said so many times, people are people around the world and uh, meeting uh, people from different countries is one of the highlights and the biggest issue is perhaps the language barrier that can that can sometimes be quite intimidating mm. but ultimately most people you meet will want to help you so. So definitely and even if you don't speak the same language you could do it with gestures and smiles and pointing and, and google translate google translate yes yeah, good yeah download the language of the country so I think that's it for this week. But mm -hmm. before we finish, can you just tell me what you're going to be doing for the rest of the day? I've got to sort my nuts out. Oh yeah, of course you have. Job number one. Yep, we bought a whole load of 
wholesale nuts, which I'm making up for my snacks, getting off the sugars and just sticking to some healthy nuts.